why we don't want to just look at the appeal to nature that well our ancestors ate that way what's the disconnect there it just comes back to realizing what the goal of our ancestors was and what evolution is it's to get you to an age to procreate evolution does not care if you have a heart attack at 60. if your goal is to increase the number of years that you live in good health you're trying to shrink the number of years where you're affected by disease then you have to look to the science that is studying people over time and looking at biomarkers that predict longevity Mm -hmm. right because we have different goals to our ancestors yes we're not just here to survive that was my friend simon hill nutritionist and host of the proof podcast who sat down with me to break down today's most popular diets and trends it can be confusing to navigate what dietary patterns are optimal for our longevity and health with a master's degree in nutrition simon has a healthy obsession with nutritional science and helps clear the mud on this topic the data on fiber is really clear there's a dose dependent relationship the more fiber you have the lower risk of colorectal cancer type 2 diabetes various forms of cancer, cardiovascular disease, and people are living longer. If you're interested in good health later in life, we have to look beyond speculation of what our ancestors may or may not have eaten. That's the other thing to consider here when we're thinking about like eating like our ancestors. Are we truly eating like them or are we kind of eating the foods that we want to eat today and making ourselves feel good by telling ourselves that that's the same foods that they ate a long time ago? He explains the hierarchy of evidence to establish which science holds more weight than others, why what's natural isn't necessarily the best for our long-term health, the truth about saturated fat, and the demonization of poofas in our diet, and we cover popular diets from paleo to Western A. Price, nourishing tradition style diets, keto, carnivore, plant paradox, and break down popular claims about butter, bone broth, anti-nutrients, seed oils, and more. While science is not perfect, we do have clear biomarkers for longevity and preventing our number one killers, and this episode goes into how these trends stack up against those markers. They have charts showing the increase in poofa consumption shows an increase in these types of diseases. How do you respond to that? Simon published a best-selling book, which I highly recommend, The Proof is in the Plants. With so many experts letting their biases get in the way to form nutritional recommendations, Simon is the nutritional resource we need right now. He steers clear of dogma, something that very few people do, and is simply interested in the best evidence of the truth. They're not appreciating that they can feel good today and still be increasing their risk of disease in decades to come because these things bubble away under the surface. Can you share your dietary thesis philosophy with everyone so they kind of know where we're coming from? Okay. Starting with the big question. So I guess I probably have a philosophy or a dietary approach that is a little bit different to what may be more common in certain diet sort of groups or tribes where people often sort of promote one diet as being the absolute optimal for human health. There's a little bit more kind of nuance in the position that that I take, um, which is less absolute in nature. It means it's harder to sell. It's a little mm. bit less of a sexy position to kind of take, and I understand that, but it's more in line with what the science shows. And with, that's my aim with everything that I do is to kind of, I hold myself to a very, you know, high degree of accountability when it comes to rigorously looking at the evidence and presenting it as objectively as possible, irrespective of my chosen diet. And when you look at the evidence, there is not a single diet. And this is why there's so much argument online. There is no evidence that you can point to that would say this is definitively the single absolute best way for every human to eat for good health today and for good long-term health. But what is clear, and that, that often when people hear that, they think, well, we just, does that mean we have no idea? No, we have a very good idea, but it's more of a theme or set of characteristics. And that, that theme, you know, that time and time again has been shown to reduce risk of a lot of the chronic disease burden that is really robbing people of quality of life today, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, various types of cancers, Alzheimer's dementia, etc. Uh, that theme that reduces the risk of all of those conditions is a diet that's low in saturated fat. It has a bias for unsaturated fats, particularly polyunsaturated fats. I think that's something we're probably going to talk about. Definitely. It's rich in fiber and it's low in ultra processed foods, right? And those are probably like the big kind of three things 
as, as well as being low or hopefully excluding trans fats, which I think everyone agrees on today. Now, so that's very broad. What can that look like? It can be a very healthy, uh, well thought out Mediterranean diet. It could be a pescatarian diet. It could be a vegetarian diet. It could be a very uh, well planned whole food plant based diet. These are all different variations of that theme. And I think that rather than that being, even though it's less absolute, rather than that being a negative thing is actually quite positive because it, it gives people choice based on what is going to be sustainable for them. Because the most important thing is when we're considering someone's, particularly someone's long-term health, is what is a dietary pattern, a way of eating that they can stick to over time? And having more options means that more people are likely to be successful. And we're, we're failing massively when you look at what the average diet looks like. So we need, we need options. And then when we start to consider other aspects of our life and our values, the health of the planet, which is inextricably tied to our own health, and we think about animal welfare, that's where, and in my book, and this comes back to your original question about my thesis, that's where I think the case becomes much stronger to adopt a diet that's as plant exclusive as possible for you. And so, you know, in, in a nutshell, that's kind of what my, my overall thesis is. Amazing. And why, why have you become so passionate about this? Why do you read so much science? When I was a little boy, I would come home and there'd be scientific papers littered all around the home. No way. My, my dad's now been a professor for, I think, 35 years going on. Still, wow. still to this day and uh, has been tremendously successful professor of physiology and publishing in cell and metabolism and all the major journals. So from a very early age, I was surrounded by studies and I knew my dad was, uh, you know, had done his PhD and was spending a lot of time in the, in the lab. I'd go in and spend time with him. My dad would be wearing a white lab coat and had like microscopes and I'd jump up and use the microscopes. And so I developed an appreciation for what science is as a tool. And it really is just a tool to help us better understand the world. And through that, we can make better decisions. It's not perfect. And science is about reducing uncertainty. And I think that can kind of make some people feel uncomfortable because they're looking for the definitive certain answer. But really, over time, what we're trying to do with the evidence base is progressively move closer to a truth mm -hmm. right R with you know respect to whatever you know topic that we're interested in so i was kind of surrounded in that environment growing up and always thought this is pretty cool um this is something that i'd like to explore and then i i you know finished high school and did an undergraduate science degree and then later on did a, a master's in nutrition science and really what fascinates me is when I look at kind of wellness culture and nutrition online there's a lot of fighting mm. there's a lot of absolute positions and there's a lot of people that are very very confident in those positions and it's actually you know if you if you're going to be really confident in a position whether it's you know something about anti-nutrients or it's about source of protein or it's about fiber there's there's so much time that needs to be invested into each of those topics, literally just to understand anti-nutrients. You know, we could be talking about months of research getting, getting across. And you know, like I'm, I'm quite, I think it's healthy, but I'm quite obsessed with like looking through that literature. And, and so, you know, I kind of feel like a lot of people are forming very strong positions without having done that work. And, and, you know, inherently or just accepting a position because it kind of suits a, a, a bias that, that someone has. Or it we sounds all, good, like, oh, this makes sense. It right. must be right. And we do that when it fits with a bias. So if we've adopted a particular diet or we've had a, a, a sort of N equals one, N equals one um, personal experience with something, we can then go looking for evidence mm -hmm. to support that. But that's really the, the reverse direction of what we should be doing. We should be starting with the evidence base, sorting it out, filtering through what's, okay, what's mechanistic, what's the strongest evidence, 
and what are the converging lines? What's it all pointing to? That's how we actually look at things through a more evidence-based lens. Our anecdotal experience is important. I wouldn't say it's invalid, but there, there's a lot of blind spots there. Mm -hmm. So over the years, I've become incredibly passionate about trying to educate people about the actual evidence base looking at nutrition and helping people understand how I come to my conclusions. And also if there's a claim that's out there, you know, what's what's wrong with or, or why would we not accept that claim? And and often you can you can look at sort of logical inconsistencies. You know, someone's taking a certain position on something here and then for another food or nutrient they're taking they sh they're taking a very different approach to how they're looking at the evidence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I find it, I just find it the whole process of looking at the evidence base and trying to communicate it and help people understand the principles, you know, really interesting and, and rewarding. Yeah. It's a really interesting topic to navigate. Like, is it only science that dictates what's the truth or do you use other facets? You know, cause I think a lot of these, um, diets or trends that we're going to be talking about today, a lot of people take the approach of either it makes sense just in their head or biology or nature's appeal and and then like you said looking for evidence that supports that bias but do you at all use any of that or is it just science to form your opinions well i mean anthropology is is a form of science and biology and mechanisms are a form of mm -hmm. science so they certainly come into it but you're right i think there's a lot of kind of the the, the naturalistic fallacy Mm -hmm. out there that a lot of people subscribe to and, and I think that's a bit of a trap. Mm. You know, I think that if we were to just live quote unquote naturally, you know, I'm of the view that that would not lead to the most optimal lifespan and health span. And so I think it could be actually a very miserable life if all you did was try and live as naturally as possible. Think, think about the extent to which you would need to do to, yes. to do that. Um, so yeah, I I sort of look at some of those things as interesting, like what it, maybe what did our ancestors eat, and you can look at that and you can deduce some things from it. All right, guys, I have to tell you about the apothecary Anima Mundi Herbals, which carries organic, wildcrafted, and ethically grown botanicals. Every vibrant and medicinally potent remedy is packaged in eco-friendly packaging of recyclable glass or biodegradable bags. Once you shop their site, you'll see what I mean. There are so many incredible goodies to get, but if you get just one thing, you've got to get their collagen beauty kit, which is full of plant magic to help support healthy hair, skin, nails, and bones. This kit includes a Dirty Rose Chai Collagen, which contains herbs known for their collagen protecting and boosting effects. It also comes with their Super Fruit Collagen, their signature formula composed of collagen boosting plants enhanced with the beautifying powers of superfruits. You also get an original collagen booster powder, a plant-based blend that's the ultimate beauty boost with adaptogens, ancient herbs, and flowers to support radiant hair, glowing skin, and healthy nails. And lastly, it comes with a collagen face oil and rose quartz gua sa, the perfect addition, which feels divine on my skin. It would be an amazing gift to give a loved one, but if not for someone special in your life, at least get it for yourself. And Anima Moody Herbals uses fair trade practices beyond organic farming, education, and small farmers to create remedies that benefit people from all walks of life. So use my code Ellen20 for 20% off. Just click the link in my show notes to get this deal. There are a number of pitfalls with those arguments as well. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our ancestors, for example, were you know, eating to survive. That's what evolution is worried about, getting you to an age to procreate, maybe a little bit beyond that. Um, and, and so they were choosing foods uh, in the environment, the, the foods that were available to them to help them survive. Mm -hmm. That doesn't speak to the types of things that I'm necessarily interested in or a lot of my community and listeners are interested in, which is how can they get to 60, 70, and 80 and not develop a certain type of cancer or not develop heart disease or not have a stroke? How can they actually just enjoy their life for longer? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, anthropology and what our ancestors ate can only kind of tell us so much. And, and you know, even, even then, I don't think there is one ancestral diet. I think the evidence is pretty clear that it varied a lot over time. So how far back are we going to go? Um, what geographical location? There's there's a lot of kind of variables and speculation there. Yeah. Right now, the term ancestral is extremely trendy. And yet, if you do call it trendy, 
people can kind of get upset. Like, no, it's not. It's ancestral. It's what it is. But really, like you said, how far back do you want to go? There's so many different types of ancestral diets. So how are you deciding which type of ancestral diet is the best for you? Paleo, nourishing traditions type style. We have keto, carnivore, all that stuff. A lot of it is kind of lumped, like, you sa- like you've said before, under an umbrella mm. term of ancestral. Yeah, I think firstly, we probably should acknowledge that there are a number of good things about those diets. And I, you know, the, the big obvious one is that they're focused on whole foods and not ultra processed you know, highly palatable, energy dense, um, refined sugar and fat dense foods. Mm -hmm. And it is those ultra processed foods that make up, you know, 60% of the average person's calories. They're driving, you know, an enormous amount of the overweight obesity sort of epidemic that we see, which is then linked to a lot of the poor metabolic health that we see, whether it's type two diabetes or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Those types of metabolic conditions are pretty much entirely driven by energy toxicity, consuming too many calories. And so as soon as you take these ultra processed foods off the table, we all know as you're, when you're focused on whole foods, you tend to eat much less calories. And that's been shown you know, in clinical studies, really high level studies. Kevin Hall at the NIH did a study looking at a um, unprocessed whole food diet versus an ultra processed food diet. And he actually matched in the foods, uh, protein and fat and uh, sugars and even fiber. Mm -hmm. And he had these people basically locked up in a metabolic ward. Mm -hmm. And it was an ad libitum study, which means you can eat as much as you want, eat until you're satisfied. And the great thing about that is you can get a a feel for satiety. Mm -hmm. How full were people? Were people filling up on one of those diets earlier? and eating less calories Mm -hmm. and it was also was a crossover study so if you were in the study you got to do the unprocessed diet for a couple weeks and then you'd switch over and Mm -hmm. people did it in different orders so it's a very like considered a very high quality type of study and on average when people were eating the ultra processed diet even though they matched for those different factors which doesn't happen in the real world Mm -hmm. uh, they were eating 500 calories more per day it makes complete sense so you know, right off the bat here, we can say like if someone's adopting a diet that is uh, quote unquote ancestral, whichever variation it might be, there are some subtle differences mm-hmm. differences between the, these different dietary patterns and some I think are, are better than others. But but straight away, that's going to, to lead to many people losing weight, which leads to many health improvements and improvements in biomarkers that predict disease, mm-hmm. whether that's their fasting glucose or their triglycerides, you know, things of blood pressure, things of that nature. So I think that's a big tick for these diets. And something that we kind of overlook is like the agreement between people coming at at nutrition from different angles. You know, there's 60% of, of someone's calories. Where I think these diets get a few things wrong is back to that theme that I mentioned at the start. I said it has... It de-emphasizes saturated fat. It has more of an emphasis on polyunsaturated fats. And there's a, there's a couple of really important reasons for that. One is in the literature, it's very clear that when you swap calories from saturated fat for polyunsaturated fat, we see an improvement in a number of important biomarkers. We see an improvement in LDL cholesterol, more specifically, ApoB, if anyone's kind of familiar with that, essentially the same same sort of thing or telling us a similar information. And we also see an improvement in insulin sensitivity. So your body's ability to shuttle glucose into cells and use it. And in the context of someone who is eating excess calories, and a lot of people are eating excess calories. You can eat an ancestral diet and still be eating excess calories. Mm. In the context of eating you know, above what your daily energy requirements are, if you're gaining weight on an ancestral diet with a lot of saturated fat, you can bet, and it will vary depending on your genetics, but you can bet it's not just subcutaneous fat under your skin, on your face or your hips or wherever. It's going to be visceral fat. We know that saturated fat really drives up the fat in the liver and also in the pancreas. There's clinical trial after clinical trial showing that. Whereas when you swap those calories from saturated fat for polyunsaturated fats, you see a reduction in this very harmful uh, ectopic fat, is what it's called scientifically, in the liver and in the pancreas. So 
you know, one of the things that I, I kind of almost laugh at is, is you know, within these crowds, they often promote these diets as best for metabolic health. Mm-hmm. And I would argue very strongly that that's not true. The liver is the, the, the master regulator of essentially of your metabolic health and metabolism. And if you're increasing the, the fat levels in the liver and in the pancreas, you are increasing insulin resistance, you're reducing your body's ability to utilize glucose. And so if you think about metabolism and metabolic health broadly, my definition would be that you're really good at being able to utilize fats and carbohydrates. That's true metabolic flexibility. But if you're eating in a way that is making you really poor at utilizing carbohydrates, I would argue that you're actually you're, you're actually uh, shifting your metabolic health in an unfavorable direction. So, so that would be kind of like one of the, the major disagreements um, between myself and someone who's putting forward a more sort of ancestral diet. Would that be specific to like keto and carnivore where they're not eating fruits and potatoes and things like that? Or are you also speaking that to someone who eats quote unquote ancestrally, but they're all, they're eating a wide variety of fruits and, and So there's a potatoes. bit of nuance here to, for us to explore and, and maybe we can kind of step through that. But this is also an area that trips people up. So when I'm using the word saturated fat right now, and I've been doing that kind of purposefully to keep it high level, but if we want to step to that next level deeper, saturated fat's an umbrella term. So not all saturated fats are the same. When we're when we're reviewing the evidence to look at is something healthy or harmful, we have to be really specific. So what type of saturated fats are we talking about? How much? If someone was replacing those saturated fats, what are they replacing it with? And for whom? What are their genetics? Mm-hmm. Okay, all of these make a, a, a really big difference. Um, does it vary based on those different diets? It depends on where someone's getting their saturated fats from. Uh, we know like saturated fats that are found in red meat and also in butter tend to drive LDL cholesterol and ApoB up quite a lot, uh, much more than the saturated fats in dairy. So you can go and look at a study, and there's one uh, Chen et al. has done a meta-analysis, which is often cited, uh, which shows that that the saturated fats in dairy compared to red meat sorry, when I say dairy, I'm not talking about butter, I'm talking about the other forms of dairy. Those saturated fats in the, in yogurt and in cheese do not increase LDL cholesterol ApoB as much as red meat does. Mm. And you could point to that study and say, see, look, dairy's you know, positive for cholesterol. Well, relative to red meat it is. But in that same study, they also looked at, well, how do those saturated fats in dairy compare to polyunsaturated fats in plant foods? And you see, you see a step again, uh, a beneficial step by swapping calories from dairy, milk, and cheese for these plant fats. So compared to what is like really important mm. when we're trying to dig into this research and and make sense of it, my kind of take home message here for the listener, because how do you make sense of all of that? They just yeah. want to know, okay, but well, I just want to know like is is the saturated fat in my diet is it is it a problem? Yeah. Go and measure your ApoB level. So what is ApoB? I think a lot of people don't know what that is. Can you explain it? We've spoken about the the two energy sources so far, glucose and fats. And you know, most people probably realize that, that sugar just kind of freely flows in the in circulation. It's water soluble. And our plasma in our blood is mostly water. So we don't have to have something that kind of chaperones or carries glucose. It can just dissolve in move through circulation and go to cells. We cannot do the same with fats, right? Mm. Fats are water insoluble. So through evolution, our body had to come up with an answer. How are we going to get these fats to our cells? And what it does is a protein, which is water soluble, you can almost imagine like a beach ball. Imagine that the outside of that is the protein, Mm -hmm. which is water soluble. And we're going to stuff the fats in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. And now that can go into circulation and it can dissolve. And then we can carry that through the blood and hopefully get it to the tissues that that need it. There are another actually analogy here that can be helpful for people to kind of think about is a cargo ship. You know, like a cargo ship Mm -hmm. that's carrying different um, containers, you know, across the sea, right? 
the cargo ship you can think about as the protein and on top of that those containers are are cholesterol and triglycerides fats there's essentially two different families of these cargo ships one of them is called apob and the other one's called apoa1 don't we don't need to think about apoa1 right now <laughs> these apob containing lipoproteins which is what they're called all of them have the capacity as they're floating through circulation to enter the artery wall get retained cause inflammation and build up as fatty plaque 90 percent of apob containing lipoproteins are ldl low density lipoproteins mm -hmm. the other 10 percent are called idl and vldls when you measure your apob directly you get the summation of ldl plus idl plus vldl okay okay so you get and this is particularly important for about 20 percent of the population where ldl cholesterol doesn't correlate with apob you get a much better idea of your risk of cardiovascular disease by going and requesting apob or if that's not available to someone they're on a on standard blood test, usually you can get non-HDL, which is, again, better than LDL cholesterol. Point being is, when you measure your APOB or non-HDL, there's reference ranges. So go and get your test done. Okay. If you're high on those, then you might want to go back to your diet and understanding that the biggest lever that you can pull to reduce those is to swap calories from saturated fats for polyunsaturated fats, which in food form means less meats, less butter in particular, and less dairy fat if you're having a lot of it, and then more fatty fish if you eat seafood, or nuts, seeds, avocado, tofu, these kind of foods. That's what that would look so like. So why is it so important to reduce it? So this comes back to the liver, and I said it's like the master regulator of, of metabolic health. One of the important functions of the liver is it has these receptors on it, these LDL receptors, and these receptors take up the ApoB particles, right? So that you can imagine that the issue with these ApoB containing lipoproteins in circulation is when they when they become too elevated, you get more of them crashing into the artery wall and getting retained. Mm -hmm. so it's part of normal physiology to have these. You know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. I mentioned it's 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 taking fats out mm -hmm. to cells so it's not a, a case of trying to get it to to zero um but different fats have different effect on the ldl receptor saturated fats decrease the sensitivity of that receptor so if you imagine that receptor is like a bit like a gate okay and it's allowing these apobs back into the liver out of circulation so it helps lower the level of apob in circulation that's one of the, the liver's jobs it, when you eat a lot of saturated fat you start to close that gate. They can't get back into the liver. So what happens? They're building up. Imagine you're back to the analogy of the, sh the cargo ship. Imagine you're looking at a port and the, the guys on the cranes have gone on strike. They're not clearing the containers. You have all of these cargo ships building up in mm -hmm. that port, right? And now these cargo ships have, uh, you know, they're hanging around for longer. They can throw their anchor down and build up and get stuck. Um, so saturated fats are reducing the receptor, the LDL receptor sensitivity. Polyunsaturated fats do the exact opposite. So polyunsaturated fats open the gate up. They help the liver clear these ApoB containing lipoproteins. So that's the biggest lever that someone can pull, and that's very clear. There's metabolic ward clinical studies where they lock people up and feed them saturated fats and polyunsaturated fats and measure all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a meta-analysis of 395 experiments, Clark, and I can put that into the show notes, that tested this exactly. Um, so again, you, know, you can't really change or intentionally change something if you don't measure it. Mm -hmm. And... So back to your question about like how does someone know and is there a difference between these different types of diets? Um, it really comes back to the type of saturated fats they're eating, what foods are, are they in, and also their genetics. So that ability for saturated fat to, to shut the gate and polyunsaturated fats to open it is also modulated by our genes. Mm -hmm. So for example, I might be able to get away with a little bit more saturated fat than you, mm -hmm. and that could be a genetic thing, mm -hmm. right? So. But Some, it's not going to be such drastic differences. It's not going to be drastic, yeah. uh, huge differences. But it is important to acknowledge that 
you know, when we look at studies, you get the typical response, the average response. None of us are exactly representative of average. So you have to take the information and then, you know, the broad theme and then individualize it and personalize it based on your lab results, based on how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those examples where you look at an important risk factor and then you can, you know, you can make a, a decision if you want to try and change you know, certain aspects of your diet. So the lab results part is really interesting to me because I want to back up and I think a lot of people might be thinking, okay, but how do I know that what you're saying is true? Because this other guy over here tells me that saturated fat is actually really good for me and it doesn't cause our biggest killers. How do I know what is true? And, and PUFAs are like the worst thing ever. You know, how do you back up and help people to see that what you're saying is because of the, the evidence, the body of evidence. Well, we have very strong data on saturated fats and hard health outcomes, which means looking at clinical trials, comparing groups that are either randomized, so these are randomized controlled trials, compare people that are randomized to saturated fat intervention or polyunsaturated fat intervention. And there's now so many of those clinical trials that you can do a meta-analysis. So Cochrane Review, which is considered one of the highest quality meta-analysis meta-analyses that can exist or group that does them, they did a 2020 meta-analysis of this and looked at exactly that. All those trials put together, what do we see? You see a 21% reduction in uh, coronary heart disease when you swap calories from saturated fat for polyunsaturated fat. It's very hard to argue with. Right? Mm -hmm. Those are hard health outcome studies. Right? We're looking at people over time who are either eating saturated fat or polyunsaturated fats and how many of them are having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we can take that a step further because it's not, it's not just that we understand that saturated fat is, uh, people that eat more saturated fat have more heart disease. We actually understand the primary mechanism by which that occurs. And it comes back to what I just mentioned before, th that saturated fat is reducing your liver's ability to clear these apoB containing lipoproteins that are mostly LDLs, um, and they build up. And we have a huge body of evidence showing that LDL cholesterol is causal, right? Directly causes atherosclerosis. So that buildup of that fatty plaque is caused by an elevation in LDL cholesterol, more specifically, these apoB containing lipoproteins. So you might say, well, what's that evidence? Okay. Well, we have observational studies, which are the weakest form of evidence I'm going to, to point to. Um, tens and tens. We have millions of person year uh, follow-up follow up, looking at people over time. How much saturated fat do, are they eating? What's their risk of heart disease? And we see very clearly across the world, cohorts all across the world, different cultures, people who eat more saturated fat have a higher risk of uh, have elevated LDL cholesterol and have a higher risk of um, coronary heart disease. And it's linear. The more the LDL cholesterol goes up, the higher their risk of heart disease. So that's like evidence one. Evidence two, we have these Mendelian studies, which is a fancy word essentially for genetic studies. So you can be born with certain gene mutations that either lower your LDL cholesterol or increase it. And these are these are incredible studies because if you think about it, it's kind of like nature's randomized controlled trial. You know, you have mommy and daddy really have no say, you just pop out and you've you've been randomized to having super low LDL cholesterol or super high. What do we see? Well, and and this is really interesting because these are people that are exposed to that level of cholesterol over a lifetime. And we know that that's super important, lifetime exposure. Mm -hmm. Same as cigarettes. Like wow. Pack years. Yeah. It's now being called cholesterol years. So there are, you know, there's so much evidence showing that people who are born with a genetic mutation that results in super elevated LDL cholesterol, these people can have a cardiac event when they're teenagers. Mm. You know, many of them die in their 20s if they're, if they're untreated. Yeah. Okay. Then we see the exact opposite that people who have super low LDL cholesterol, incredibly low risk of heart disease. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're like won the genetic lottery and their LDL cholesterol is just crazy low down at physiologic levels, like 30 milligrams per deciliter, these people are not getting heart disease. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's number two. And then, um, you know, number three is randomized controlled trials. So you take 
people later in life, once they have cardiovascular disease, usually you give them a drug that lowers their LDL cholesterol and you look at hard endpoints. What happens? Do they have less heart attacks? Are they, are they less likely to die? And you see the same thing again. Now, you in those studies, people often point to the fact that the risk reduction is, is not huge. And I like to remind people that you can only do so much. When you're 65 and you start to intervene after decades and decades and decades of pounding saturated fat and having all this damage and plaque accumulation in the artery, you can't expect to have the same risk reduction that you would have if you won the genetic lottery and had low cholesterol from birth. Mm -hmm. right? So that's why we see different risk reductions between the genetic studies and the clinical trials. Um, but we So we have that observational data, we have genetic studies, and we have randomized controlled trials, mm -hmm. all telling us the same thing, mm -hmm. that when you get LDL cholesterol down, people have less events, heart attacks and, and strokes. So I think that's pretty compelling evidence. It's not certainly not something that you know I would want to ignore. I've got cardiovascular disease in my family. I've, my, I watched my dad have a heart attack at 41. Um, so I take this stuff pretty seriously. You know, I kind of, I want to get to 50, 60, 70 and, 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 you know, hopefully be in good health and, um, you know, not rushed, rushed off to hospital having some sort of cardiac event. Totally. I mean, that's really compelling evidence. So for anybody who maybe is skeptical of research and science and wants to look back more at the appeal to nature type of look, how do you respond to that when they, cause you, you sort of touched on it, but can you go into a little bit further about why we don't want to just look at uh, the appeal to nature that, well, our ancestors ate that way. What is, what's the disconnect there? Well, I think we just have to, it just comes back to realizing like what the goal of, of our ancestors was and what evolution is. It's to get you to an age to procreate. Evolution does not care if you have a heart attack at 60. Mm -hmm. Evolution does not care if you have a heart attack at 70. It doesn't care if you get cancer at 60 or 70, mm -hmm. right? So, if you're interested in good health later in life, we have to look beyond speculation of what our ancestors may or may not have eaten. Yeah. And back to what I said earlier, I don't even think we can put our finger on like this is the ancestral diet. Mm -hmm. You can get some general no themes, yeah. but it, there's there's no way of of doing that. So, you know, I think you can you can look at that and be interested in it. But if your goal is to increase the number of years that you live in good health, which is essentially increasing your health span. You're trying to shrink the number of years where you're affected by disease. Then you have to look to the science that is studying people over time and looking at biomarkers that predict longevity, mm -hmm. right? Because we have different goals to our ancestors. Yes. We're not just here to survive. We have so many food um, options available to us that our ancestors didn't. And so we're in this privileged position of saying, okay, we don't have to just go out and eat calories to survive and eat whatever we can get our hands on. We can actually look at the science that we have and make a more calculated decision and increase our chance of getting to 60, 65 without developing cancer, without having a heart attack, without having a stroke. And so that, hopefully you know, to our eighties and nineties. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the other thing to consider here is the types of foods that our ancestors were eating and whether they are the same as the types of foods that people who are adopting different variations of these ancestral diets are eating today, specifically meat. So there's a really interesting paper by Lauren Cordain, who is kind of like the, the father or one of the fathers of the paleo diet. And he wanted to look at what are the, the typical cholesterol levels in hunter-gatherer tribes. And anyone can go out and look at this, and there's a beautiful graph in there. And with the data that's available to us looking at different hunter-gatherer tribes, we know that their cholesterol levels are not high. Now, you might think, well, how can that be if they're eating a lot of animal foods that are rich in saturated fats? What's happening here? Well, there's good kind of archaeological evidence that suggests the types of meats that our ancestors were eating were probably a lot leaner than the types of meats today. So leaner than than beef and lamb. You know, our ancestors would have been eating woolly mammoth and antelope and and you know venison type of type of meats. So um, you know that's that's the other thing to kind of consider here when we're thinking about like eating like our ancestors. Are we truly eating like them or are we kind of just eating the foods that we want to eat today and making ourselves feel good by 
you know, telling ourselves that that's the same foods that they ate a long time ago. Um, so that's the kind of, you know, that's the way that, that I think about that. I think a lot of people who might be listening, maybe your audience, but definitely my audience might be younger. And so they're, they may, they might not be thinking that far down the road. And so it's easy to just go to this. Oh yeah, this makes sense. This, you know, nature, this is how our ancestors ate, not realizing that there are certain foods that definitely prevent our biggest killers. So when you take that evidence into consideration, it kind of goes against that personal bias that you would mm. have. But can you go into PUFAs then? Because mm -hmm. this is kind of their, their big pushback on that explanation right. about saturated fat as well. Look at the charts. They have charts showing like the increase in PUFA consumption shows an increase in these types of diseases. Mm. How do you respond to that? Firstly, that's some of the most weakest data that you can present. That's called ecological. So, what okay, so why is it? Weak? I, what I find is interesting because it's unadjusted. So you can basically just go out and look at two different trends and show an association, right? If if you go out and say in the last uh, hundred years, poofers have increased and obesity has increased, therefore poofers must be causing obesity. There's so many other things that have also changed mm. during that period. People are more sedentary. Uh, people are eating 60% of their calories from ultra-processed foods. Mm -hmm. Now, they may contain PUFAs, but that doesn't so that doesn't mean that PUFAs are inherently a problem. Right? It doesn't that, mean that, that's the PUFA that's that's a food in matrix. the ultra-processed food. Yeah, right. it's There's the so whole... many different things in there, yeah. and they're hyperpalatable, they're low protein, they're low water, they're low fiber, all of these different myriad of characteristics that can lead to overconsumption. I kind of look at that ecological association, and mind you, what is left out there often is that PUFAs have gone up since 1960. Cardiovascular disease mortality has halved since 1960. Hmm. They're inverse. So I could sit here and create the same argument the same and say, thing. we've increased PUFAs dramatically since 1960 and less people are dying of cardiovascular disease. I think it's a pretty weak argument. I wouldn't really make it. But that's the kind of same kind of logic. So for anyone to saying like, what is a PUFA? PUFA is a, a polyunsaturated fat. So there's, there's essentially high level. There's, there's four different types of fats, saturated fats, trans fats, monounsaturated fats with a do one double, double bond, polyunsaturated fats with two or more. The foods that are richest in, in polyunsaturated fats are fatty fish, your walnuts, chia seeds, flax seeds, these types of foods. And then monounsaturated fats are rich in like avocados and olive oil, and saturated fats tend to be richest in animal foods, but not exclusively. So there are some plant foods like coconut oil and palm oil, which mm -hmm. are the two tropical oils that are rich in, in saturated uh, fat. The claims around polyunsaturated fats that I've seen are that people say they increase inflammation uh, and people say that they're obesogenic, they increase uh, body weight and that they increase risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, we've just spoken to the clinical studies that contradict the cardiovascular disease point. I think the most compelling evidence that we have that we can look at here for just polyunsaturated fats in general and if people need to be worried about them, do we need to fear them? Right. Right? I'm not paid by big polyunsaturated fat. Yeah. I could quite easily have low polyunsaturated fats and, and eat monounsaturated fats. Mm -hmm. But the evidence suggests if you're limiting polyunsaturated fats in your diet, you're leaving health on the table. And Which is so contradictory to this world of eating and at what they advocate for. It's like PUFAs are the right. worst, especially specifically seed oils. Right. Like but a lot of that's oil. also the, nat the naturalistic fallacy. It's how they're produced. They'll show videos of the production and say, look, this can't be healthy. And, you know, I think that's interesting. But I think, again, you have to go and look at the evidence that we have. And we have really solid evidence that shows, and it's not just observational evidence where you do a dietary assessment and then look at outcomes. The neat thing with polyunsaturated fats is that they're essential. Our body doesn't make them. So when you measure them in circulation or in, t in tissues, what does that mean? That means they must have come in through your diet. Mm, like as opposed to saturated fats. Right. So you can... That do, our body you makes. Can For do, anyone who doesn't know that, that our body makes. Yeah. So our body can make saturated fats. The, there are studies, large population studies, where they not only do a dietary assessment, they actually measure, they do a, 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 uh, either serum, so looking at circulation or adipose tissue, looking at the actual levels of linoleic acid, which is an omega-6, so it's a type of polyunsaturated fat. It is the, the polyunsaturated fat that is most rich in seed oils. Right? So in these studies with tens and tens of thousands of people, 
they go and measure how much linoleic acid, omega-6, is in their fat tissue and is in circulation. And then they look at, okay, based on um, the variance in these levels, is there a difference in health outcomes? Do the people that have more linoleic acid in their, in their fat stored in their body, do they have uh, a, an increase in certain diseases? Mm -hmm. Are they living longer? Are they living shorter? What do you see? You see people that have more linoleic acid, these polyunsaturated fats, in their tissues, this is in their body, okay? They have lower risk of cardiovascular disease. They have lower risk of dying from cardiovascular disease, and they have lower risk of total mortality, which means death from all causes. These people with more linoleic acid, and I'll link to this study because if, if, if anyone is of the view that polyunsaturated fats are harmful, you have to read this paper. There's, there's multiple papers. Um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of them. People that have more linoleic acid in their tissue have lower to total mortality. They're living longer. So wow. I, I look at that data and I find it very hard to take the position that polyunsaturated fats are harmful and that we need to avoid them. What about the difference, though, between like a whole walnut versus canola oil, right? Is it, is, are many of the studies understanding the difference there? Are they looking at the difference? There are some studies that have attempted to look at the difference between oils uh, and whole foods like olive oil and nuts. And, you know, generally, my view, I think the whole food is probably better. And I say that mostly because you're getting slightly better nutrition, but also from a satiety point of view, oils are very calorie dense. So mm -hmm. if someone's goal is to lose weight, lowering the calorie density of the diet is, is a good thing. Uh, but at the same, same by the same, you know, at the same time, I I wouldn't generate fear over over oils at all. If someone's cooking with those oils in their diet and is a healthy body weight, and they're not gaining weight, then it's a way better option than butter. Than cooking it with butter, right? That's super interesting. Which think... is now, you know, ironically, is being marketed as a superfood again. Yeah, butter, butter is a superfood now, guys. It's back and forth, back and forth. You just never know what it is. But you feel like the science is pretty clear that it's one. And it's not really back or forth. Like if we go back to where I kind of begun with saturated fat, the reason that you can, you, you'll see different views out there is people are not considering the context. What is the dose of saturated fat? What type of saturated fat? What's it being compared to? And who are the people in the study? And if you don't consider that context, you can get easily confused on this topic. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to processed food, ultra processed foods, then oil is a comp component. The, those processed oils like canola oil and different seed oils, they are a component of the pro ultra processed foods. So what is it that makes ultra processed foods unhealthy? Is it just the fact that it's, they're calorie dense and low in nutrients or is it more than that? It, could it be that it's, oil, it's the fact that it's isolated foods like processed sugar and oils and lack of fiber and low in nutrients, all of that? It's an answer that is still up for debate. Right, people are still looking at it, but I mean, if you if you think about it just generally, we know that they're hyper palatable and they lead to excessive calorie consumption, and we know that that energy toxicity is really damaging. I think that it's a twofold kind of problem here. One is that these foods are they're low fiber, they're low water, they're usually low protein, they're calorie dense. All of these things leads to overconsumption. Right, they're not great from a satiety point of view, mm -hmm. filling you up on fewer calories. Yeah, but and lower less nutrients. The other thing is, what's the opportunity cost when you're eating these foods? What are you not eating? Mm -hmm. Other foods that have inherent benefits that come with a lot of nutrition, fruits and vegetables and legumes. Mm -hmm. th these types of, of foods are being pushed out of the diet. So I think you see the the net effect on health is a summation of those two things. Mm, yes. I think that's a missing component people are often thinking about. Like if I eat if I'm eating this ultra processed food every single day for every snack every day or every lunch, then you're missing the opportunity mm. to eat whole plant foods with lots of vegetables mm. and fresh fruits and nutrient dense calories. I think we can get into now specifics on some of the claims of these trends. And I think maybe we should first cut like round out the topic of butter. It's very becoming very popular now that, oh, we're getting back to the way that our great-grandparents lived on a farm and they milk their own cow and then we make our own butter. And it's so healthy for us. Why is it not so healthy for us? Other than what you already explained. The big two reasons are, 
ApoB, so it's going to increase ApoB. We've got to remember, heart disease is the number one cause of death globally. It's the most likely reason that any of the listeners are going to die. Right? Mm. So you should take that pretty seriously. Yeah. If there's a biomarker you're going to be most interested in, it's ApoB. Um, I also mentioned that saturated fat. So butter is very rich in saturated fats, and particularly the saturated fats that increase hepatic fat. So increase that fat that's building up in the liver, it's building up in the pancreas, it leads to insulin resistance. Yeah. So from a metabolic health, it's going to be damaging there compared to eating foods that are rich in, in unsaturated fats, whether that's monounsaturated fats or polyunsaturated fats. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think that the, the reason that this is trendy is because people see it as kind of natural, ancestral, but they're not appreciating that they can feel good today and still be increasing their risk of disease in decades to come because these things bubble away under the surface. Mm, right? That that is such an important point because people might say, "Well, I feel good eating this way. I'm, you know, I'm eating these whole foods from animal products as a basis of my diet, and I feel good. So how could I possibly be, you know, promoting the disease of of the majority of what Americans are eating because they see that the majority of Americans are eating right. lots of ultra processed foods. So they think, well, I'm doing it differently. I'm eating whole foods, it's just like largely from animal sources, mm -hmm. but they think that's very different than what the standard American is eating that are also dying of. So, And it is better and, and it, it makes sense that they feel good relative to a standard American diet eating that way. Absolutely. It's just not necessarily, necessarily re representative of how they're going to feel in 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So it, it comes back to what are you valuing and what are your goals here? Right. If you're if you're just thinking about the here and now and how you feel today and you're not so concerned about you know 20, 30, 40 years down the track, then maybe maybe that doesn't matter. Hmm. I mean, I do think people do care about that, but they're thinking that it's not going to cause that because they're they are so um, convinced that it's actually like the poofas that are causing. The science is very clear that there is a theme that is consistent with long term good long term health, and that is a diet that is low in saturated fats, it's rich in polyunsaturated fats, it's low in ultra processed foods. This is not debated in nutrition in the academic science world. It's only debated online. Mm. It, is, it is absolutely the consensus position with regards to how do we get people to feel really good today and feel better long term. And I can empathize with someone who adopts you know, quote unquote ancestral kind of diet and feels better today. I would just urge them to consider some food swaps and look, some people feel better on a low carbohydrate diet. Some people lose more weight on a low carbohydrate diet. Some people lose more weight on a high carb diet. We know that's very clear in the trials. Multiple ways to do it. Why that is the case, not so sure yet. It hasn't been elucidated. Is it genetics? Is it something to do with the food reward systems and differences between people? Um, unsure. But but what I would urge someone who's adopted that that style of eating is to within that framework, what are the changes you can make that are going to shift some of these very potent risk factors in the right direction? Right? Mm -hmm. How are we going to get your visceral fat down, that fat out of your liver and out of your pancreas? How are we going to get ApoB down? And can you do that in a way where you still feel happy and you enjoy your diet? Mm -hmm. That's kind of you know the, the position that I would take with that. Do you think um, uh, listing out the different types of diets – that are trendy right now that maybe are super high in saturated fat or very high in saturated fat, but they are have different variations, different kinds of sets of guidelines. Do you think they are very different from each other or pretty similar from each other? Some of them are kind of more of a step in the right direction, I think, than others. Like, you, I mean, if you go fully to the far, far left, you're at a carnivore all meat diet with no fiber. And, you know, the, the data on fiber is really clear. There's a dose dependent relationship the more fiber you have, the lower risk of colorectal cancer, type 2 diabetes, various forms of cancer, cardiovascular disease, and people are living longer. And that actually doesn't seem to tap out at 30, 35 grams a day, which is what the recommendations are. Average person's only getting about 15. Wow. It seems to go beyond that, right? And, and there's just not enough people in these studies consuming 50 grams plus to get a, a, a sort of fully appreciate that. But certainly, so if you if we were kind of looking at different ancestral diets, I think the ones that lean in more to different types of fruits and some vegetables, and so they're, they're 
consuming more fiber, I think those are a healthier variation of those um, types of diets. And, and I bet if it was to be studied and you compared all these different types, those the people that are eating in that way with a more of a high fiber approach, they would have healthier, um, their risk factors would look better than the people who are just going completely carnivore, mm-hmm. very high saturated fat and, and no or very low fiber. What about the difference between a dietary pattern that excludes dairy and does a lot of different kinds of meat, like maybe chicken and turkey mm. um, and fruits and vegetables versus a diet that is rich in red meat and butter and cheese and whole milk and also fruits and vegetables? Mm-hmm. How do you compare those two? I Which think if be, you were going to-, to include animal foods in your diet and you wanted to do it in the most healthful manner, it's the Mediterranean diet. Mm-hmm. It's a diet that has more of an emphasis on fatty fish. It has a low emphasis on red and white meat. I don't think that white meat is particularly is, – is, is, there's not much signal to suggest it's much better than red meat. Both of them seem to be just as kind of problematic as one another. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't have any red or white meat in your diet. This is another area where people get very confused. There, the dose of a lot of these things is the poison. And so when you even if you look at the red meat uh, literature and you look at unprocessed red meat, I think this is super interesting. And this is something that many in the vegan community are not appreciating or communicating. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a bias there. Yeah, totally. Right? But I, as I said at the start, I think you should just, just put the information out as it is. Mm-hmm. And if you want to argue about the planet, planet or animal welfare, that's, that's separate. Mm-hmm. So when you look at the red meat um, literature that we have, there's really conflicting results. So some studies sh- suggest that red meat is not increasing risk of cardiovascular disease or colorectal cancer. They're like the big two that, that come up with red, unprocessed red meat, whereas other studies suggest it is. So why the difference? Hmm. You know, has science confused here again? Dig into the study studies, look at the context. So what you see is very consistently in North America, when you compare high and low unprocessed red meat intake, you see an increase in risk of cardiovascular disease, colorectal cancer. When you look at Asian cohorts and you compare high and low, you tend not to see that. Hmm. Here's the really important thing. When you're comparing high and low, those are just relative things. It really depends what is high and what is low. What is low. And in Asia, they're not consuming much unprocessed red meat. So when you're comparing high and low, they're both actually low and they're very close together. So, of course, you don't see a difference. Interesting. When you look at the American cohorts and now you get this beautiful contrast because you get some people that have 150 grams of red meat a day Mm -hmm. unprocessed, some people that have very little. Now you can see signal. You see increased risk of colorectal cancer, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So instead of like looking at, you know, just part of that evidence and, and choosing the one that suits you, let's look at all of it and realize that probably what we're seeing here is that the dose matters a lot. And so when you're getting up over 100 grams of unprocessed red meat a day, it seems pretty consistent that you're increasing your risk of cardiovascular disease and colorectal cancer. Um, So if I was to eat a diet that contained animal foods, and I certainly think you can adopt a healthy diet that does contain animal foods, it would be a very plant-rich Mediterranean diet Mm -hmm. that's featuring more fatty fish and legumes and some whole grains, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds and olive oil, and then it de-emphasizes the kind of inclusion of both white and red meat. Mm, Interesting. And then what about the dairy component? Because these two types of diet options I was explaining I think would be more like a paleo that's excluding Mm. dairy versus like a Western, a Western A price nourishing traditions type diet that eats a lot of dairy. The the evidence on dairy is pretty interesting as well. so I think, you know, firstly, it depends on what you're comparing it to. I think dairy can be part of a healthy dietary pattern, but uh, it probably comes down to what type of dairy are we talking about and, um, you know, how much is someone consuming? So, yeah, so can we get some concrete, like how, what does how much those different rates of too much, hmm. not as much? Probably one or two serves a day of Mm -hmm. yogurt and cheese yogurt and cheese like the fermented dairy Mm -hmm. seem to be the ones that are either neutral or perhaps even in some circumstances beneficial 
um, you know, they're providing calcium and protein. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to replace them, I, I think you can have a dairy free diet and be just as healthy, but their replacement's really important. Mm -hmm. You're replacing with foods that are rich in calcium, rich in, in protein and ferment, have fermented foods in your diet. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's why if, the what you're replacing it is so important when you said it can be beneficial is like, okay, if you're taking out red meat and butter and swapping it for yogurt, mm -hmm. that is beneficial. Correct. But if you take out these dairy foods and instead eat ultra processed foods, that's probably a move in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it depends what you replace it with. If you, if you replace it with... Um, you know, a soy yogurt, for example, or soy milk, you're moving in, the, in a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, so that's important. And then just realizing that the saturated fats in dairy do have a different effect on our body than the saturated fats in red meat. Um, and the reason why butter is so problematic is that butter is a heavily refined food, massively mm -hmm. refined. And so to, to make butter, you actually have to essentially you change the structure of the food matrix and in in cheese in yogurt in less processed forms of dairy the saturated fats are suspended in what's called a milk fat globule mm -hmm. and that milk fat globule reduces the effect that saturated fats have on our apob cholesterol and our cholesterol mm. in butter you break that milk fat globule down so now these saturated fats are all of a sudden much more potent. Okay, so let's talk a little about some other specific claims like bone broth. That's a really big one right now. The bone broth is super nourishing, very good for you. It enhances your health in all different kinds of ways. What does the evidence say about that? I think they they think that bone broth contains you know certain minerals and amino acids and collagen. And so therefore they assume that this is good for gut health and skin and hair and stuff like that. But I think strong claims do require strong evidence. <laughs> and there's literally a debt. There's like no evidence looking at how bone broth affects human health. <laughs> there's one safety study, which I think is important because these like bone broth and gelatin, uh, these can be highly concentrated in heavy metals like lead, cadmium. So, there was one study that looked into that because people were concerned. And that study seemed to suggest that at least in that sample that the levels were actually probably safe for humans, which is good, but it could be highly variable depending on where you're sourcing this from. Um, but in terms of like the benefits of it, there's just no clinical data. So it's all anecdotal. Is and there without any having a control in place, mm -hmm. you have no idea. Like you need to have a control in place to understand like how much of the benefit is placebo driven by placebo, how much of it is driven by the actual constituents in this food and how it um, interacts with your physiology. The studies that do exist are looking at kind of mice and it's very hard to extrapolate from those papers. Yeah, totally. And what about real vitamin A? That's something mm -hmm. that you hear a lot that you need, you shouldn't be eating, you know, just, you shouldn't be getting your vitamin A from plants because of the conversion and mm -hmm. need real vitamin A retinol. Mm. So beta, our body will convert beta carotene to vitamin A. And unless you have a specific gene mutation that is really downshifting that conversion, your body will convert enough. And we know that. And we, I, can, I can link to a uh, one study, there's many, but a, a study out of Switzerland that was looking at omnivores, vegetarians, and vegans. The vegans were eating a very high-quality diet. We know that because they were consuming about 35 to 40 grams of fiber a day. Really important when you're looking at these studies to kind of work out, is this like a junk food vegan diet or is it a healthy one? Yeah. This seemed to be representative of uh, a healthy diet, and these were kind of middle-aged adults. And they assessed their actual vitamin A levels, serum vitamin A levels, and they were completely fine in the in the vegan group across the board, no issues at all. So, uh, is there genetic anomalies, and is there is there going to be individuals out there who maybe are not as good at converting beta carotene? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, back to what I said earlier, we know the general characteristics of healthy diets. We know what works for the typical person for most people, but there is some level of individualization that you need to explore here, right? Which is my approach is understand the theme and then explore the indiv individualization within that theme and, you know, kind of fine tune and optimize things from there. Okay.
Okay, now I want to talk about anti nutrients. Mm-hmm. That's a big one too. Now, love the you know you shouldn't yeah. be eating the foods with anti nutrients. Where is that claim coming from, and what are your thoughts on it? So we might we probably have to like step through two or three of these. Okay, lectins come up, phytates come up, and oxalates. Okay, they're probably the big three. There's also tannins and saponins and. Um, you know, goitrogens, right. we could spend all day discussing. Yeah, this, yeah, but, but those three. Where, yeah, the big three. So lectins, uh, you know, what are lectins? I, I, I think, firstly, back to what I, I said earlier about people having very strong opinions about lectins. I think a lot of people say that and are not even fully familiar with what a lectin is. Yeah, totally. So a lectin is a protein. Okay. There's over 500 different types of lectins um, found in plant foods. And the claim is that lectins negatively affect the gut lining. That leads to separation of what's called the tight junctions. And it creates these gaps that allows compounds to flow from the intestine into the bloodstream that ordinarily wouldn't, and they provoke an inflammatory response. That separation of the tight junctions in science is called increased intestinal permeability in lay sort of um, language is called leaky gut. Mm -hmm. So lectins, leaky gut, inflammation, that's the narrative Mm -hmm. that's out there, Mm -hmm. right? So therefore, we should be very scared of the most lectin-containing foods, which which is legumes and whole grains. So we kind of need to step through this. Let's start with, let's start zooming in on the claims and the evidence that someone might put forward that, is in support of this. And this came mostly from Stephen Gundry, who wrote Plant Paradox uh, a few years back. He sort of put this on the map and then people have run with it. And he conveniently, he sells a supplement called Lectin Shield. (laughs) So he created the problem and he sells you the solution. Uh Uh, But I was incredibly interested to, I read his book and I wanted to know what is the evidence that he's putting forward here? Um, And so firstly, he cites studies looking at uh, animal studies where they take isolated lectins. So this is not, pe- not people or animals being fed a whole food. Literally extract the lectin out, give a very high dose to an animal and see what happens. See if you can increase inflammation. And there are some studies that show that. Mm-hmm. But we have to understand that one compound from a food that we isolate out in an animal study, I mean, how, how can we generalize that to a human? That would never happen in real life. That isolated compound could behave and and very likely does very differently when it's in a whole food form Mm -hmm. uh, matrix and when it's being consumed by humans in a dose that they would be exposed to in their diet ordinarily. Uh So that's, that's the first thing that the predominantly what he's doing is citing animal studies. Secondly, he does cite some human studies. And so there are studies showing people that consumed legumes. uh, There was, you know, varying degrees of, of toxicity. All of these studies, and it's very clear in them, they're case studies where when humans were consuming improperly prepared legumes. Mm. What does that mean? So that's not soaking and boiling, which you would do if you were buying sort of dried beans. Yeah. When you're buying canned beans, that's already done for you. Okay. And so how are you eating that, legumes if you're not boiling it? Well, you can you can boil it and not boil it for long enough. Oh, and so okay. the way to the way to know this is if you bite into a, a legume, and I don't recommend eating them if they're like this, is if <laughs> yeah. they're still a little bit hard and crunchy. Yeah, they should be very soft. Yeah, you should put it between your molars, yes. and they just squish down mm-hmm. like the enchiladas we had last night. Yeah, they were very good. Uh, so, and the reason for that is that when you soak and cook these foods properly, ninety three to ninety six percent of the lectins are destroyed. Oh my gosh! And there is. Study after study showing that. So the one, the human studies, like they just didn't cook them properly. They just didn't cook them properly, and it's actually noted in the studies. Like these were people who had toxicity. That's ridiculous. So, <laughs> and then the other thing that Gundry cites, and he makes a big deal of it, he says that there is peer-reviewed evidence that lectins are um, inflammatory and damaging to human health. And if you actually look up that citation. It's an abstract that he wrote in a journal, sure, but it's just an abstract summarizing a poster that he had at a conference, which is just explaining anecdotal case studies that he saw as a doctor. 
That's not a clinical no. trial. That's not people who were randomized to a diet that was low lectin and a high lectin diet and looked at outcomes. Right? There, there could be many reasons why his results were what they were. They're going to be affected by all sorts of biases, terribly weak data. And then, you know, so we could almost just stop there. But let's just zoom out and think about this a little bit more. Let's look at People, the people that are eating the most legumes, what's their health like long term? And we actually see a dose-dependent response again here. We see that as people increase their legume consumption up to about 400 grams a week, and then it plateaus. Up to 400 grams a week, they're reducing their risk of all sorts of chronic diseases, cancer, cardiovascular disease, events, and mortality. And that's, I guess, two or three cups. You know, every every sort of piece of information that we have about the lectin story suggests that it's not something to fear if you're properly preparing your foods. I don't recommend slow cooking legumes. Slow cooking legumes is usually done at a lower temperature. Okay. And when you slow cook legumes and it's below 100 degrees, you actually can get an increase in lectins. So that's something for people to be mindful of. And just being mindful of when you're when you're eating whole grains and you're eating lectins, are they cooked? Are they do they taste cooked or do they taste crunchy and hard? Yeah. If they taste crunchy and hard, then you know you probably want to take them back to the pot and cook them properly. I can't believe that about the study that they just were testing against like mm -hmm. legumes in a way that people don't eat. You don't really want to eat mm -hmm. legumes like that. Yeah. And there's a I, I put this on my phone, but there's a, a paper that I'll give you that people can read. It's called "Is There Such a Thing as Anti Nutrients: A Narrative Review of Perceived Problematic Plant Compounds." By Petrosky, okay. et al. and so there's there's kind of like a really nice summary of, of some of those things that I just discussed. And it, does that include like all the different anti nutrients? Not yeah, those. so phytates and oxalates, and oxalates is super interesting. Okay, let's get into that one. Uh, That's one that Paul Saladino talks about, I think. Right? He talks about phytates too. So I mean, oxalates. The main claim is that oxalates bind calcium, and they increase risk of calcium oxalate kidney stones. First thing for people to understand here is that more than 50% of oxalates that are in your circulation are not from your diet. Your mm. body makes them. Mm. Okay, so that's a really important point because often people are sort of suggesting that any food that contains oxalates are, we yeah. should steer clear of, but they're completely unaware of the physiology that our body actually makes oxalates uh -huh. and we have a system in place to get rid of them. They get filtered out. Um, by the kidney and excreted through the urine. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first thing to realize. The second thing is there are studies looking at different dietary patterns and people with calcium oxalate kidney stones. What are the best dietary patterns for these people? Yeah, And it's quite clear, and there's no studies looking at a plant-exclusive vegan diet, but there is studies looking at a vegetarian diet. Mm -hmm. And the vegetarian diet is associated with the lowest risk of these calcium oxalate How kidney is that stones, possible? even though it's high in oxalates. Here's, here's what it comes down to. High oxalates is only, high dietary oxalates, is only going to be a problem for someone who's consuming insufficient amounts of calcium. Yeah. And this is why anyone who, who if, if someone's listening, who had, has a history of calcium oxalate kidney stones, they one of the first things they'll be told by their physician is, make sure you're getting enough calcium in your diet. Because... When you're consuming a diet that's high in oxalates but has low calcium, much more of that oxalate will be absorbed. Mm -hmm. But when you're consuming a diet that's rich in calcium and has high oxalates, the calcium is binding to the oxalates and they get excreted through the body. They're not even absorbed into circulation. So if someone's eating a plant-based diet and they're getting enough calcium, there's no issue here. The only time someone would, would really ever run into a problem with oxalates in a plant-based diet is if for some reason they had no diversity and they chose to get all of their calcium from really high oxalate foods like spinach and rhubarb greens. Okay. But if you're eating with diversity and you've got these low oxalate greens like kale and rocket or arugula, whatever you call it, yeah. in your diet, then you have you know nothing to worry about there. Um, the, the other interesting thing here is that the endogenous production of oxalates is really interesting because 
when you consume more animal protein, and it's, it's, it's not fully understood how this occurs, but it's thought to be the type of amino acids, particularly amino acids like hydroxyproline, you actually increase the amount of oxalate your body produces. High animal protein diets are very strongly associated with calcium oxalate kidney stones, as is high sodium. So generally the recommendations for someone, if they want to avoid a, a calcium oxalate kidney stone or they have them and they don't want to get another one or exacerbate it, is to make sure you have enough calcium in your diet, to make sure you have enough potassium, which is fruits and vegetables. And we know very clearly people who consume more fruits and vegetables have less kidney stones. And what's the calcium recommendations you have? You want to get at least north of seven, 800 milligrams a day. From what sources? So you can go dark leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables. Um, you've got your white beans have calcium in them. A lot of the kind of soy milk or plant-based milks now will have them. You can get some tofu, calcium set tofu, uh, sesame seeds, mm -hmm. you know, all of those sorts of things yeah. are going to be where you get it from. And you want to try and target seven to 800 milligrams or north of that mm -hmm. per day. And if someone wanted to track that, they can use an app like Chronometer and just put a day of eating in and kind of see where they land. Mm -hmm. But enough calcium, enough potassium, de-emphasizing animal protein and de-emphasizing sodium. Sodium is another one that really drives up the risk of these kidney stones. Um, these, are, these are more things for people to focus on if they have a family history of a calcium oxalate kidney stone or if they've had one themselves. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about Paul Saladino. We talked about the, the mm -hmm. oxalate and I want to get to the phytate too, but you worked out with him recently. Mm -hmm. How how did that go? It was fun. Like he he's a you know a, a nice charismatic dude, and yeah, we had a good chat, and um, we disagree on a lot of things, but we also agree on quite a number of things. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I had a good time, and hopefully in the future at some point we can kind of sit down and flesh yeah. things out. But we we worked out for two or three hours. We. We literally trained everything that we could, every body yeah. part, <laughs> uh, and just chatted about science and our different views. And yeah, it yeah. was it was a it was a very interesting, but it was like a friendly conversation. I yeah, yeah, yeah. I disagree a lot with Paul, but I also appreciate that he's changed his views a few times on on certain things. And yeah, he seems open to that. As of I, I've changed my view on certain yeah. things over the years. So I think. If I was going to have a discussion with someone that has it comes at this from a different angle, then he would be a good person to to do that with. Yes, I would love I would love to do that conversation. Just maybe one day mm. we'll put it out there with Paul Saladino and you guys would make an amazing match. Um, so something else he talks about a lot is phytates. Mm. What do you? He says about? phytates will rob you of minerals. Yeah, that's the main claim. Where is he in that claim? So the there is that. some truth that phytates can bind minerals, particularly iron and zinc. Mm -hmm. uh, again, phytates are largely destroyed when you cook, soak food. So phytates are, are kind of you know, found mostly in whole grains, in um, some in legumes and nuts and seeds. Mm. Um, and Paul will point to a single study where there was a single meal, right, looking at, you know, a high phytate kind of meal and what happened to the absorption of certain minerals. Yeah. And that's interesting. But we have more evidence showing that the body is very adaptive. So as you habitually consume a high phytate diet, mm -hmm. the body responds. So in that single meal, you might see reduced mineral absorption, but there's it's a great study looking at postmenopausal women and iron absorption with high phytate diets. And when you get them consuming it habitually for weeks, what happens? The body ramps up iron absorption. It adjusts. So this is another example of just like looking at the study in context, understanding what other evidence is out there, and then... And, then, and why it might be doing that. Maybe the person's not used to eating those right. foods. So when you start on that, it's going to have a different kind of response when mm -hmm. you don't normally eat that food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... And so there, are, you know, it's certainly, I think, again, properly preparing your foods is important. It will increase the mineral availability in your food, particularly iron and zinc. And if someone has low iron, then they might want to think about this even more. 
So what are some of the things that you can do if you're consuming plant foods that contain phytates other than just preparing them properly to increase iron absorption and zinc absorption? There's a, f a few different things. One is increase the sources of vitamin C in your diet. So squeezing uh, lime or lemon juice on a salad or eating bell peppers, um, capsicum we call them in Australia with food, they're really rich in, in vitamin C. Things of, of that nature will increase absorption of iron. Cooking with garlic and onion, um, both of these alliums increase iron absorption. So mm -hmm. if you're whatever kind of stir fry or whatever dinner you're preparing, if you can work garlic and onion in, they will significantly increase the absorption of iron and zinc. And then the other one is fermented foods. So fermented foods also will increase the bioavailability of iron and zinc and other minerals that are that are in your food. So if you know, that's probably too much for someone to focus on if their iron levels are fine. Yeah. But if you're noticing that your iron levels are low, then you might want to kind of look into that. Yeah. I think all this stuff is super interesting about the phytates and the oxalates and then even as far as like the saturated fat and unsaturated fat, I feel like sometimes it feels like it's missing the component of just a holistic perspective. Like I'm actually even surprised that Paul would be look at looking at it in that mm. way. Like one specific mechanism in a food and I know that's like science but I like I, I feel like if you just take a step back it just reminds me of the um the book whole for mm -hmm. thinking the science of nutrition by T Colin Campbell yeah. the nutritional biochemist I loved that book that was one of my favorite nutrition books what do you think about that about his complaint about looking at science in the wrong way like focusing on one specific nutrient in a food or something right. a component of a food But I think food. that the scientists and researchers are aware of that Mm -hmm. right? So like, for example, in this case, yeah, you have the single meal study where they look at one food that's high in phytate and look at mineral absorption. Yeah. But there are studies looking at, at mixed meals. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason mixed meals is important is that, you know, you have things like vitamin C and, and garlic and onion in a mixed meal, mm -hmm. which is more representative of how someone would eat in real life. Yeah. Right. So it's not that, that the researchers are unaware of this. The problem is when you're trying to build a case on social media and you just go and select one piece of that evidence. Yeah, totally. Um, I think in this case, when you look at the overall evidence, it's quite clear that, you know, phytates aren't something that people need to be scared of. If if anything, and this is an emerging area of science, phytates have anti-cancer properties. So they're being looked at very heavily for treatment during cancer. Wow. And they seem to, you know, there's, there's a few different mechanisms but they seem to reduce free radicals and oxidative stress damage mm -hmm. to cells so um i think that's worth noting as well as you know these are often painted as harmful bad compounds yeah. but they they might also be beneficial at a certain dose too. a certain type of thing that's interesting yeah. uh, for people listening simon and i have been going back and forth about saturated fat and coconut mm. because i tend to just naturally feel like coconut is obviously a health food just like living in Hawaii it just feels it makes sense to me but you have a problem with looking at food in that way and to looking at it with the scientific perspective but I'm curious maybe you can we can get into it just a tiny bit about is it possible that the studies on saturated fat or just in general anything PUFAs all of it are missing that maybe it's not just the saturated fat or just the polyunsaturated fat that's affecting the health outcome it's the holistic part of the food so is it possible that the saturated fat in coconut is going to respond differently in our bodies than the saturated fat in red meat it's not just possible we know that so it's not as though these studies haven't sort of separated out different foods and different types of saturated fat and looked at their unique effects on lipids that has been done and there are some subtle differences though when it comes to coconut but when you look at say the effect of saturated fats found typically in a food like red meat or butter and you compare those to the saturated fats in coconut oil. Now they both raise LDL cholesterol but the butter, the saturated fats in butter and in red meat on a gram per gram basis increase LDL cholesterol more than coconut mm -hmm. oil in that case, mm -hmm. right? Where the data is a little bit limited on coconut is a couple of places. One is that unlike the saturated fats that are in red meat where we have hard health outcome data, we know that they actually increase events. Remember I spoke about those trials. With coconut oil, all we have is this data that shows that coconut oil raises LDL cholesterol. And 
as we went over before, we have reason to believe strongly that that means they're going to have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, but we don't have the longer term trials with coconut products showing actual increases in events, mm -hmm. right? So we're kind of, we are speculating a little bit more on coconut than we would say on a food like butter or red meat, which we know much more about. The other layer here is how important is the food matrix? So I'm hoping that the listeners, one thing that they take home is that the food matrix is really important and it affects how saturated fats affect your physiology. The example I gave before was that yogurt and cheese has a different effect on your blood lipids than butter because the more refined it became, mm -hmm. it affected the way that those saturated fats were absorbed and ultimately how they'd affect blood lipids. Mm -hmm. Now, it may well be a very similar thing with coconut. Coconut oil may have a, a, a a different or significantly different effect on blood lipids than eating coconut flesh. Mm -hmm. So I'm sounding like a broken record here, but what I would say is if you're including coconut products in your diet, it's the same rule as before. You can't meaningfully change something or understand your risk if you're not measuring. So go and measure APOB mm -hmm. or non-HDL, whatever is available to you. Where can you go measure that? You just see your physician and ask for a, a blood test okay. and say to them, is, does this test include non-HDL, which most tests routinely should. And you can go the extra step and say, hey, I'd like to order APOB. Now, they might have a small charge for that. You can work out whether you're prepared to pay that or not, or you can just use the non-HDL, which is, you know, correlates pretty well with APOB in most circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just being picky when I'm saying get APOB. Non-HDL is a pretty damn good predictor of cardiovascular disease okay so moral of the story is to test your levels know where you're at and then you can tweak and titrate saturated fat in your diet you know we spoke about some of the food um, swaps that someone might look at before to get to an optimal apob level such that when you're walking around in your day to day and you're going to bed at night you're not laying down this fatty plaque in your arteries. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we're that's where we're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. The principle of science is that context matters, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I don't see that in fear and say science hasn't worked it out. It's all over the place. Yeah. I say, hey, how can we explain this? And when it's it is fully explainable, it's just it's not something that you can deliver in one sentence. Yeah. Right? So it requires a bit more of an in depth discussion. Now that is different arguably though to what you would say to someone when you're just you know if i was sitting down with someone just trying to tell them how to eat i'm mm -hmm. not going into all of those details necessarily yeah. i would explain high level what are the characteristics of a healthy dietary pattern which we did i'd give them choice they could choose uh, the one that they the the variant that they thought they could adhere to best and then i'd say okay what what you're going to do is you're going to adopt that diet and then we're going to measure some things over time mm -hmm. let's make sure that, that that diet is working for you mm -hmm. we know what biomarkers predict disease so we start you off with a healthy dietary pattern and then let's measure some things let's look at apob let's look at fasting glucose hba1c triglycerides your blood pressure let's use those lab tests in addition to using functional tests like let's look at your cardiorespiratory fitness your um your strength these types of things that we know all to, all together, they, they come together, coalesce to predict your longevity, how well you're going to live. So that that's kind of you know my overall approach here. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I don't think this is a case of science hasn't worked it out. I think that it's just science showing us that context really matters. Yeah. But can it be work can it work really well cohesively with things like our biology so do you ever use the argument of how the length of our intestines compared to the length of a length of a lion's intestines or is that not is that like a moot point for you it's not a moot point i think it's i think that stuff is interesting mm -hmm. um but I, I certainly don't think it's anywhere near as compelling as looking at hard health outcomes mm -hmm. when someone does something what is their risk of having an event? Because that's what we care about. Mm -hmm. No, that makes are, sense. Are we going yeah. to? So I think that there's a whole lot more speculation and extrapolation required to go from anthropology mm -hmm. to saying, okay, based on anthropology, we should eat this way. I think yeah. you have to you, you have to make a ton of assumptions. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think that some of the more refined approaches of science that are looking and trying to control for variables and looking at specific exposures and looking at hard health outcomes yeah. and some of the biomarkers that are established as good predictors of disease, I think that's a much more meaningful um, way to 
determine what food choices are going to improve our health span the most. Yeah, I think the concern that people often have is that we might be going in the wrong direction in certain places, like take, for instance, plant milk. So mm. a lot of people have this concern and skepticism about plant milk. Now it's trendy to think that, you know, you, you're naturally now should be getting milk from a your backyard cow. Get a cow mm. and have your own backyard, raw milk, and that bottled plant milk is not good for you, doesn't enhance your health. Whereas maybe someone in your realm might be thinking, well, the science shows that when you add supplemental vitamin D to this, uh, you know, to, for this processed food, because wouldn't plant milk be considered a processed food? It would be, but yeah. I wouldn't say that a processed food inherently is harmful no yeah, matter what. Yeah, yeah, not totally. This is not like ultra processed foods, but... We have to essentially almost i hate using this word but biohack yeah to to get get our physiology or help our physiology stay healthy for for yeah. longer um but to to the point about like plant milks you know i would agree with some of the skepticism there are things that i would look out for like if, if you were if you were buying plant milks again we have to consider okay so what is someone taking out of their diet so if they're taking out dairy which i said earlier can feature within a healthy dietary pattern if someone's taking it out Usually that's maybe they're lactose intolerant or for planetary health or animal welfare reasons. If they're removing those foods from their diet, then we want to make sure that they're getting adequate amount of calcium, protein, um, vitamin D, etc. And also at the same time, you know, ideally they're not swapping for a plant milk that is super loaded with refined sugars. Mm -hmm. So I think you can make sensible swaps and then you can make swaps that really don't make sense from a nutrition point of view yeah. and, and reading the label is, you know, an important starting point there. Yeah. So uh, let's move on to the next one, beef liver. What do mm. you think about the hype that beef liver is very good for you and it's a superfood? If, if I was eating an only meat diet, then I probably would eat organs okay. right? because they do contain certain nutrients that you wouldn't get otherwise mm -hmm. or you it would be very hard to get. Yeah. Um, so in that context, sure. But I would also be really aware that if you eat too much, you run the risk of vitamin A toxicity. Some of these are very heavily concentrated. Mm -hmm. And more is not always better. Vitamin A toxicity, excess vitamin A has been linked with various forms of cancer. Uh, excess iron, some of these organs are very rich in iron. Mm -hmm. We know that that can cause oxidative stress. is linked with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So... In that particular context where someone doesn't have fruits and vegetables and is missing out on a bunch of these nutrients, you could create an argument for it. Mm -hmm. But if you're eating an otherwise healthy diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, you don't need organ meats. And this whole idea of vitamin A toxicity, is the amount that you'd have to eat to reach that point a lot of, of organ meats or is it a pretty it's small It's very amount? highly concentrated. It wouldn't actually be that much. The exact number of grams I'd have to kind of look up. It's not something that I'm looking at every yeah, yeah. day. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, you could you could easily reach that amount in a week, like exceed the upper yeah. limit. And so why does the these other camps, going back to someone like Paul Saladino, is he looking at the evidence differently than you? Or what does he think about the evidence compared well, to Well, I you? think he just falls into the naturalistic fallacy. Okay. And... and is convincing himself that whatever our ancestors ate is best from a longevity point of view, mm -hmm. which I, I've kind of explained I would strongly disagree with. Yeah. Um, so he he does that and then he kind of tries to find cherry picks evidence to um, argue against, you know, some of these positions that we've gone through, like mm -hmm. cherry pick a phytate study looking at a single feeding thing mm -hmm. or cherry pick a lectin study looking at feeding isolated lectins mm -hmm. to mice but not looking at the actual bigger picture where you're looking at people eating lots of lectin containing foods having better health outcomes mm -hmm. um, so largely we have a different view of the evidence hierarchy mm -hmm. so he's much seems to be much more focused in sort of short-term anecdote and ancestral sort of um, line of thinking I'm more interested in looking at ex uh, human exposure both through observational studies and in clinical trials and meta-analyses of, of clinical trials. I think that's a much more robust, valid, reliable way mm -hmm. of determining what's healthy in the long term. Right. But something he's done is criticize something like epidemiological studies but then use an epidemiological mm -hmm. study to promote something that he just really want, wants yeah, to so believe he, is good. 
he does that a lot. He cited he actually cited that Chen paper that I mentioned before that looks at dairy fats. Okay. And that's the one where you can show that dairy was reducing cardiovascular disease risk relative to uh, the types of saturated fat found in red meat. Mm -hmm. um, but in the same analysis, they looked at dairy compared to polyunsaturated fats, and that bit was conveniently left out. Left out. Um, that you know, people that were eating more polyunsaturated fats had even lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Mm. Um, so there's, that's an example of a logical kind of inconsistency. Mm -hmm. One, he's not representing that paper completely um, sort of transparently yeah. to the people that he's communicating with. And then secondly, that study is an epidemiological observational study. So you can't take the position elsewhere that epidemiology is terrible, food frequency questionnaires are terrible, yet then find an epidemiology study that you like because it's a food that you like to consume and cite it. Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's double standards. That's being inconsistent. That's really helpful for people to see when they're deciding where to take who to take information from because, you know, most of the people listening, like myself, we don't know how to read research. So we have to trust the source that we're listening to. So you want to find somebody that's being logically consistent across the board. That's something you're doing very differently than even a lot of the plant based doctors. Willing yeah. to admit that you know fatty fish could be a potentially right. better swap than than um, other things, and also like you said, certain types of dairies like fermented dairy. Mm -hmm. That's not something you're not really that you're hearing from other plant based doctors, right. and it's possible that our the biases are coming into play, just like we're accusing mm -hmm. this other diet realm of doing. Mm -hmm. So we picked on um, ancestral diets a lot. <laughs> this and episode. I kind of feel bad. <laughs> Sorry, but guys. there's actually like a lot that you do agree with. Like yeah. you've said. I, and, and you know what? I I really commend anyone that has like just taken the initiative and has the willpower to change their diet mm -hmm. and move away from the status quo of a standard diet that's not serving them. Mm -hmm. um, I just want people to understand that there are other options and there are tweaks and things that they can do to go to the next level mm -hmm. and feel healthier for, for longer. So I don't want it to, to seem like I'm picking on the, the individual. Mm -hmm. I understand why people adopt these diets and I understand that people in the short term feel better and I think that's amazing. I just want people to be aware of some of these other factors maybe that aren't being communicated by the people that they're listening to mm -hmm. so that in 30 years' time they, they don't have any regrets there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. So what is something specific within the vegan community Ooh, diet realm? Shots fired. That you, are, you, are you trying to get me <laughs> get you in trouble. cancelled from everyone? <laughs> cancelled from both sides. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where do we start? Uh, you know, I think one of the, the, the more problematic, um, and you kind of alluded actually to one thing within the vegan community, is just this, this kind of general notion that a plant exclusive vegan diet is the healthiest diet mm -hmm. you can't make that you cannot make that argument scientifically mm -hmm. it's it's extremely difficult to mm -hmm. do that yeah you would have to be very inconsistent in the way that you're looking at evidence mm -hmm. um so i think for, up, up front first and foremost is that animal foods can feature in a healthy diet mm -hmm. and if they're in there like you said it probably is leaning more towards fatty fish and kind of fermented types of uh, yogurt and cheese and smaller amounts yeah and smaller amounts it's a plant rich diet those are not necessarily the hero of the plate they're more of a, a kind of side uh, dish and that diet has been described all the way back you know since the early research looking at heart disease that came out of um, Henry Blackburn and Ansel Keys work so I think that's the first thing is that really the strongest argument to adopt a vegan diet is based on planetary health or animal welfare, particularly animal welfare. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think what people fall, the trap they fall into is because they're so passionate about animal welfare or planetary health that now let's just go find evidence that's going to mm -hmm. create this argument that the vegan diet's the best diet. Mm -hmm. I don't think you need to do that. Mm -hmm. I think all you need to, to be able to explain is that if you adopt a thoughtfully constructed plant exclusive diet, you can be really healthy. There are some things you need to think about. There are some nutrients of focus. Every single diet has limitations. Let's air them. Let's be aware of the limitations. Let's adopt it in a way where it's optimized and then it's in line with the values that you have. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. The second is I'd say like when you sort of drill down a bit more specifically into the, the 
construction of a plant-based diet. Mm-hmm. There, and this is kind of fading, but there has been a message for low-fat vegan diets. Mm-hmm. I've never really been a big fan of that. And there's a few reasons. One, I think that it often leads to people consuming insufficient calories. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, I've worked with enough women to, to see that on, on such diets where they're super low in fat, particularly if they're an active person, then and then they're consuming insufficient calories. You know, it can really mess with their hormones. Mm-hmm. They can lose their period. Yeah, for all them, sorts which messes of your fertility. Right. So all sorts yeah. of th- a cascade of things can occur if you're adopting a diet that's not nourishing you and providing you with enough energy. Yeah. And that can happen when you go super low fat. It's very low calorie density. It's high volume food. Mm-hmm. And if you're not a big eater, yeah. you can fall into that. Try. Also, because it's just not as delicious. Right. Like when you're not eating food that's as delicious, yeah. it's hard to eat enough calories from it. So now, the flip side of that fat. is, and yeah. where these diets, where we've kind of made an error, is that there are studies showing that those diets can be really good for someone with really poor metabolic health mm-hmm. who needs to lose a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. That's a different context to a woman in her 30s, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, who's at a completely different life stage. She's metabolically healthy, mm-hmm. she's active, maybe yeah. she wants to have kids, all that sort yeah. of stuff. So I don't like low fat because from the perspective for certain people, it can lead to energy restriction. It can affect your absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, so A, D, E, and K, Mm -hmm. which can be problematic. And perhaps most importantly, it's limiting polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats, Mm -hmm. which I think the evidence clearly shows are inherently beneficial. These are not... These are not uh, compounds that we want to avoid. Mm-hmm. We actually want them to be in our diet because they keep us insulin sensitive. They drive down ApoB, which means we're getting less of that fatty plaque building up um, in the arteries. So they're, they're probably like the, the 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 big ticket items where I would disagree yep. with people in the vegan community. I'm sure there's more, but those are the big ones. Do you know where they got this uh, concept that we should be eating lower fat? Those well, specific it's from, it's, doctors? It's from studies like Dean Ornish's Lifestyle Heart Study, mm-hmm. which was looking at people with, you know, it's a secondary prevention study. So they have, these are, these are sick people mm-hmm. that have heart disease, they're overweight. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, in that circumstance, you kind of need to throw everything at it. Yeah. And, and th- it's a very different context to this, the average person who's thinking about adopting a plant-based diet. Yeah. So I think what's happened is those studies came out, mainly the Dean Ornish one, also, Esselstyn's study, which we could talk about that for a long time, but that's not actually a controlled trial. It's more of a case study. It's very hard to to deduce any solid findings from that. But Dean Ornish's, his clinical trial, which again, it's not just diet. They also stopped smoking. They started exercising. Yeah. They did stress reduction. So a little bit hard to say it's just the diet. Mm-hmm. Um, but the dietary intervention, nonetheless, was low fat. And so what happened off the back of that was, you know, a lot of uh, books and a lot of articles and a lot of conferences, people talking about low fat being the best for heart disease. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somehow that's been generalized just to everyone doing that. But the issue with that is, firstly, the type of people that they were studying were quite sick. But secondly, we have other evidence, clinical trials that have looked at low fat diets versus uh, higher fat diets, but with a bias for unsaturated fats. And mm-hmm. there's a recent one called the Cordio Prev. This is a seven year randomized control trial. Mm-hmm. And this trial, unlike the Dean Ornish one, the only thing they changed was diet. So you get a much better look at the actual inherent benefits of mm-hmm. diet. Now, some people might argue that the low fat version wasn't low enough, but still it was much lower than the group who were having higher fat, but from olive oil and unsaturated fat sources. Over seven years, what happened? Who did better? The low fat diet? And mm-hmm. these were both healthy whole food diets. Mm-hmm. Who does better? Low fat or the high fat with the unsaturated fat bias? The latter. The mm-hmm. high fat, unsaturated fat bias had significantly less cardiovascular disease. Mm-hmm. They had better flow mediation, um, mediated dilation, which means their arteries were actually operating better. And they had less. Uh, plaque build up in their carotid artery so they had regression of any plaque that was in there Mm. so i think that you know we can't ignore evidence like that there's there's 
then that's not the only bit of evidence. There's other clinical trials that show that speak to these unsaturated fats being inherently yeah. beneficial. So, you know, I like to communicate that so that people don't see fat as like it's we don't have to demonize fat. We yeah. need to understand that fat is an umbrella term. Mm hmm. And even how I explained before, saturated fat's an umbrella term. Mm -hmm. But if we just simplify and we say fat's an umbrella term, underneath it you have saturated fats, you have monounsaturated fats, and you have polyunsaturated fats. Rather than thinking about like restricting total fat, think about the quality of the fats you're eating. Mm -hmm. What foods are providing the fats? Yeah. And if those foods tend to be fatty fish, if you eat seafood, or um, nuts and seeds tofu and avocado and olive oil or avocado oil things of that nature then those fats are, are completely healthy for you and you shouldn't fear them yes i love that i love my avocado i eat so much avocado in my diet and it makes me feel so good and i think that it is definitely a part of a healthy diet specifically for women like you said women in their fertility age is it's so important and healthful to eat healthy amounts of fats and i think really considering about how one of the main reasons why so many people or why people often stop eating plant-based mm. is often they're not eating enough calories and it's a lot harder to get enough calories when you're not eating healthy fat sources. Mm -hmm. So that's a really important to talk about. I'm glad you brought that up. So just kind of to round it out, what is the point of all this? Is it longevity? Is it feeling your best in the current moment? And I think that could be just be like an individual answer for people. But is it when you're looking at science, is it anything other than just longevity? Is it also feeling good right now? Or is it is does the science show that the that longevity and feeling good right now are cohesive? They're cohesive. Uh, but I also think this probably requires like a bit of a deeper philosophical yeah, examination yeah. <laughs> totally. to this question, so right? So true. like, why do we want to live longer? Mm. And I, I read a study recently and it was looking at people before they were dying and what their biggest regrets were. And their what biggest was regret was that they didn't live the life that they wanted to live. Mm. They lived the life that others wanted them to live. Oh, wow. So I think if, if we're going to have this conversation about longevity, mm -hmm. first and foremost, it's examining, you know, why do we love life? Are we living the life that we want to, to live? Mm -hmm. And when we are and you feel that, of course you want to live for as long as possible. Yes. Right? So, yes. so we kind of, I think we reframe that rather than just this scientific pursuit of just living long. Yeah. Right? We really want to live better and not just physically but emotionally. Mm -hmm. And so getting clear on like why do we want to do that, it's going to be a little bit different for each person. I think that's kind of the starting point. Mm -hmm. And then that can kind of hold people to some of these things that we've been discussing and behavior change and building it into to becoming a, a lifestyle with a bit more meaning. Yes, totally. And it helps look at it at a holistic perspective too, that it's not just about food, feeling good, yeah. longevity. It's so clearly not just about food. Right. I've got uh, these retreats at the end of this year and the whole focus is on it's on, it's on like longevity optimization, mm -hmm. right? And going into it, I was thinking like, what can I impart on the people that are coming? Like, what, how can I be most effective here? Mm -hmm. And uh, to your point that it's not just nutrition, like nutrition is just a tiny, not a tiny, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, a, it's a chunk of what mm -hmm. we're going to be exploring. Mm -hmm. But we're really going to teach people about all of the different biomarkers and predictors of longevity mm -hmm. and then how to intervene on that through nutrition mm -hmm. through exercise and movement which we haven't spoken about but that's you know yeah. a, a huge part here through stress reduction and practices to improve your emotional health and happiness mm -hmm. you know all of this really matters at the end of the day yeah i love it thank you so much for being here i think this is a great way to end this conversation we touched on so much a lot of your conversations on your podcast can get quite long too mm. right because you're honing on like a specific you could do a whole episode on a four hours is the longest four hours yeah. that's super that long. was a debate that was actually a debate on seed oils oh i, I watched that one seed oils versus saturated fat yeah you moderated it i moderated i watched that one yeah. definitely some of it went over my head but it was very interesting yeah <laughs> i love debates i think debates are the best um but thank you so much for being here we've had such a great time with you so far we have a few more days till you leave mm -hmm. and looking forward to getting a surf in today. yes yes and, totally but it's a yeah it's a it's a pleasure i've, I've loved it and thanks for yeah. opening up your home of and course hanging out. i love your kids beautiful oh thank um, you they and love Andrew, you so yeah. yeah it's been amazing and i just feel grateful yeah me so awesome well, thanks for being here we're gonna end it right now <laughs> <laughs>